week of their time in, in uh, towns. <clears throat> also, I would like to uh, add a special thanks to uh, some of the individuals here that have made this event possible. Margaret Obush, who has coordinated our event. Brian Caudill, who's in charge of all of our communications and publicity. Uh, Alan Lighthizer, who helps uh, Brian in that effort. Lewis Mackley and Keith Walton, who are web streaming this live. Uh, provide all of our uh, audiovisual assistance. Uh, Mary West and Barb Michniak are um, budget officers, and again, uh, Lewis McConnell. Okay, so um, I'm sitting in my office uh, a year ago, and one of uh, my favorite students walks into my office and says, Professor Cummings, I have an idea. Good evening. First, I'd like to extend the warmest welcome to all the students, faculty, distinguished guests, and fans of hip hop that have gathered here tonight at West Virginia University College of Law. As you all know, we're here to celebrate and discuss the impact that hip hop music is having on our laws, culture, and overall outlook on society. And just in case you couldn't tell from the number of people that are here in the courtroom tonight, we just have one of the most popular and successful hip hop artists on the planet here to lead the discussion. <laughs> But for those, who, for those of you that don't know, please allow me a few words about tonight's keynote speaker, Talib Kweli. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Talib Kweli spent his formative years performing in New York City and Cincinnati, Ohio, where he established, established his reputation as a unique talent. In 1998, his ascension as a hip hop heavyweight began to team with fellow Brooklyn native host that performed Black Star. The duo was only album, which featured socially conscious lyrics and high quality production, achieved critical acclaim and launched successful careers for both artists. Kweli went on to collaborate album's producer, High Tech, and released in the second album, <coughs> Reflection Eternal, which was also well received by critics. However, it was his fourth album, entitled Quality, which established Quality as a mainstream commercial success. Released in 2002, Quality sold more than a half million copies to give Quality a certified gold album. It included the smash hit single, Get By, which utilized memorable lyrics and the signature Kanye West beat to blow up the airways well in 2003. Quickly Hell is a classic album by fans of hip-hop, Quality was followed by a number of successful ventures for Quality, including his latest release, Eardrum, which debuted as the number two album on the Billboard charts to find its release in 2007. In addition to collaborating with artists such as Kanye West, Common, Mary J. Blige, John Legend, Will I Am, and Justin Timberlake, Quality made multiple appearances on Dave Chappelle's show and has appeared in television commercials for the Big Ten Network. He also teamed with Most Def to purchase Nakiru Books, formerly the oldest African American bookstore in Brooklyn and converted into the Curious Center for Education and Culture. This nonprofit center promoted literacy with a special emphasis on the contributions of African Americans to literature, history, music, art, and the sciences. However, as for his ability to address complex issues through his music, its literary quality remains most well known. Prominent hip hop artist Jay Z, lamenting the necessity of dumbing down lyrics to sell records, once rhymed, The skills sold, truth be told, I'd probably be lyrically Talib Kweli. <laughs> Still, clever lyrics alone have not elevated Talib Kweli to his current popularity. Even he has acknowledged this, rhyming, I speak at schools a lot because they say I'm intelligent. No, it's because I'm dope. If I was whack, I'd be irrelevant. <laughs> well, regardless of whether it's because he's intelligent or because he's just plain dope, we're sure our are proud to have him here tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Talib Kweli. sure that y'all could do, oh no, it's Thursday night, <laughs> Thursday night, 30 Rock is coming on tonight, so, uh, it feels like the weekend to me because I was just, I just came from Los Angeles, I was out there um, for a while, and um, my weekend was kind of extended, I was out there celebrating, um, there was a lot of parties going on, and I uh, celebrating a release of a good friend of mine, John Forte, he just got released out of prison, and uh, we were just having a good time out there, but, uh, so it's still like the weekend to me, forgive me, you know. Uh, but um, I, am, I am extremely humbled that y'all chose to have me for this discussion and that you invited me down here. And um, I look forward to this dialogue and this conversation. And, and you're going to see from the way that I speak that my style is going to be real conversational. Um, I wrote some things that I want to share with y'all. And I'm going to talk for, uh, for a minute. But then I really, really look forward to the question and answer. That to me is the heart um, of what... I do when I come to speak to y'all. So, um, 
First off, I was in the hotel room for a second when I got here. I landed about 3 o'clock. And I was watching Colin Powell did an interview with Don Lemon on CNN. And I don't know when the interview took place, but what was interesting to me was Colin Powell talked about how much he he loved Barack Obama and how, how this moment was having such an impact on him that every day when he woke up, he'd just be like, wow, he just really felt it. He told a story about being younger, how he grew up in the Bronx, and how they, they found out when he was a little kid that they were going to have a black bus driver in the South. And how that was amazing to them as little kids. Like, wow, we have a black bus driver. And the first thing they thought was, he better not crash. That's the first thing they thought. <laughs> and, um, he said, he, just in his lifetime, to go from having that low self-esteem of feeling that inferior to where you feel like, wow, you have a black bus, bus driver to having a black president, you know, it, it made him cry, you know, to see him crying, to see Jesse Jackson on TV crying, he's a grown-ass man, you know. You know they, they seen a lot, of, a lot of stuff, you know. Jesse seen a lot of stuff. Colin Powell, he, you know, he fought, he seen a lot of stuff, so. Um, but it's interesting because it made me think about well, first interesting thing about it was it made me think about Colin Powell was probably just like, <clears throat> man, I was in the Bush administration and I got off scot free. Like, I'm good. <laughs> that was the first thing, like, you know, he seemed a little set over happy about that, but um, it made me think about my my conversion to being a supporter um, of somebody like Barack Obama and how it happened through hip hop. Um, you know, I'm somebody who has not voted when I when I came of age to vote. I voted for Bill Clinton for president, and okay. and um, it's not that I didn't like Bill Clinton as a president. Um, I just saw what how that office was disrespected with the Ken Starr stuff and everything. And then say what you want to say about what he did, and he lied and everything. Like he did, he did that. Definitely. He did that. But um, <laughs> but just what what the political process became to to deal with that situation, um, it just was real kind of disgusting. I just couldn't believe that I participated in it. It was something that I didn't want to participate in. I did, and I said, you know what? He got elected president, but it, you know, it, it seemed like there was so much stuff going at him, there's so many obstacles, there was so such like, like it just was a real turnoff to me, just what what it became degraded to. Um, and so I was done, and I was kind of like the poster boy for that. Like I was able to articulate my views very clearly about why I didn't vote. And how, you know, I was like, okay, if I'm not going to vote, I'm not going to complain about politics. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about social social conditions because that's something I feel like I can change. I feel like in my community, with my music, that's something I can put my hands on. Um, and so that's what I started focusing on. And, and um, you know, here comes Barack Obama. And, and you know, first is my mom, who's just like, she's she like a gangbanger for Democrats. Like, 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 oh, like, you know, she's rotten. And, um, you know, it don't even matter. If they write, they want she just write. And, and, and I couldn't really roll with that. I'm like, yeah, you know, I know he's black. You know, I get it. You know, he's dope. You know, he can speak well. Um, you know, and then my brother, my younger brother, was actually a lawyer. Um, and he, he started, really, he started campaigning, like going out on campaign trails and going out and knocking on doors and stuff like that. You know, my brother, for him to get that involved, it made me take a second look at what this, this, this dude was doing. And um, then my children, the effect that this black man running for president had on my children was really important to me. And, and I started to see from what he was doing that, okay, with the right amount of energy and time, and this is somebody who maybe could have a shot at this. I never saw in my lifetime anybody who had a shot at becoming president, because I separate politics from presidential and like government politics. It's different from like school board elections and stuff in the community. But on that level of presidential politics, I never saw anybody who I could relate to. Well, you know, actually, you know, to be real and to be frank, I had a shot. You know, the closest was Al Sharpton. You know, and that, that's what a lot of people like, But Al Sharpton was running for president. I'm like, some things he said, I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree with that. But then I was, then there's other things I was like, oh, man. <laughs> started to happen and I started to think about it and then I got a call from his office and and it, it, it came into my office but that was impressive to me because you know I've actively been out there like nah you know not actively but you know they have asked me ever like nah I don't vote 
you know, and, and rock the rock the boat will come and try to give you concerts. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't believe in the lesser two evils. I'm not going to just tell people to vote blindly. People don't know what they're voting for. They don't know, know what these things represent. They don't know about the electoral college, and they, they don't know how. Well, you know, but there's a lot of just information that people are not utilizing when they when they're being told to just go out and vote. And if you vote in, and you don't know what you're voting for, that's counter revolutionary. That's that's just as bad as you know voting for the wrong party. I think. Um, but you know, um, all these things started to happen, and, and when when I got the call for the campaign, it was like, okay, now Barack Obama is starting to knock down all the things that I thought would never happen. I thought the politicians, you know, would never pay attention to, to what we were talking about in the hip hop community. Um, in my lifetime, I hadn't seen it. I, I worked with Russell Simmons on his uh, hip hop summits. I did a hip hop summit at All Star Weekend in Houston uh, a few years back. And it was good because it was All Star Weekend, so all the, all the artists and celebrities were in town, so they could all come to the, uh, to the hip hop summit. And the thing I noticed was, the, 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 all the senators and all the politicians were there, and they were in the back, and no one knew who they were. They were representing their districts, and they, but they knew that the kids knew the artists. So the kids, the artists would come up, the kids would cheer for the artists, and then they would introduce a senator or somebody, and they would come up, and no one knew who they were, and they didn't know who the kids were, and they didn't know who the artists were. And the first thing they would do was thank Coca Cola or something. Like that was the first thing they would do. Like, like it was crazy. Like let me thank GE for me down here. Let me thank Coca Cola. Let me thank you know. I like Coca-Cola, and you know I use GE products, but that that ain't the time and place for that. And that's that that's how deep and wide and disconnected to me was. It's like it didn't even make no sense. Um, but yeah, so I started seeing uh, different things, and, and so I put a blog on my MySpace page supporting Barack Obama, which was big for me because I always been like, nah, I don't support any candidates. And I got him a song with um, Kids in the Hall, hip hop group out of Chicago. They had always been very supportive of um, uh, President Obama's campaign from the, from the beginning. And they seized the opportunity when they saw that I switched up a little bit to holler at me. And, and they got Bun B from uh, UGK, a uh, seminal um, rap group out of Houston, Texas, who had never you know, supported a candidate before in his life as well. And me and Bun got on the work to do remix. And you can go on YouTube and check that out. But I started to see that you know, this hip hop, uh, the, the, the Hip hop being involved in that campaign um, wasn't just activist rappers at this point. It's like, okay, Bun B's doing okay. Now, Young Jeezy got, you know, my president is black. It was like, he's like, okay, you know, I motivated thugs, but you motivate me. You know, it's like, okay, this is something that's not uh, necessarily intellectual, you know, but it's something that on a base level people really understand what how powerful this moment is. I mean, Young, young Jeezy, you know. He's wearing a snowman t-shirt. He's like, I sell cocaine. That's what I do. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he talked about, Keisha. I don't know. That's what young Jesus talking about selling cocaine. <laughs> so, but he's like, you know, I support Barack Obama. You know? You know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, don't tell Jesus I said that. <laughs> you know, I was on tour with Nas. It was interesting, in the summertime, it was interesting because Nas had a, Nas had a, a, a problem with young Jesus. Because he had said hip hop is dead, when he came out with the album title "Hip Hop Is Dead." Young Jeezy spoke up for the rappers in the South. He said hip hop ain't dead; it's in the South. Um, and he said, you know, I, I don't I take offense to you saying hip hop is dead because your type of hip hop is not what's successful on the radio anymore. And so they had a little thing in the in the internet and the blogs and everything for a second. But it was nice to see Nas jump on the President's Black song with Young Jeezy. And then Nas was also he had Nas had a, um, Nas been on that for a minute. He had a song back in the days, I want to talk to the mayor and the governor and the motherfucking president. I want to talk to the FBI and the CIA. And I forgot the rest of it. Yeah. So he was on that. That was not a song from three, four years ago. And now he has a song like where he said for Tupac, Tupac saying, um, uh, although it's been heaven said, we ain't ready to see a black president. And he had put a song like that on his album. So he had like three songs in a row that he was performing, dedicated to Barack Obama. And then Green Lantern, who was Nas DJ at the time, put me on a remix of that song with Busta Rhymes and David Banner. And, um, you know, these are just things that I'm seeing. I'm just seeing the, 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 the ball in motion. I'm seeing how this single event is really changing what, you know, what people are talking about. And I've always maintained that the best art, and hip-hop is one of the best forms of art, but the best art follows the people. 
follows the lead of the people and it accurately documents and describes what people are going through. People sometimes get it misconstrued because they see the power of the images on television or they hear songs on radio and they think that, well, these artists have so much power to influence the generation. They do, but the artists are influenced by where they come out. You know, the art in the 60s wasn't revolutionary because the artists themselves were revolutionaries because, you know, the community was like James Brown, you know, if you don't cut your conk, we ain't rocking with you this year. You know what I'm saying? That's what it was. The community put that out there. Like, Ray Charles wanted to perform, and, and that's about when he went in, in Georgia. He wanted to go, and, and the community was like, nah, Ray, we ain't rolling with you. And he had to change the way that he saw things. And that that's what created this revolutionary art. So it's not really, I mean, it's up to the artist. It's up to everybody, because everybody has a responsibility as a human being. But it's up to the, to the teachers and the students, and the lawyers, and the, the uh, activists, and people on the street. It's up to those people to inspire. Uh, artists to, so that they can they can make inspirational music. You know, um, I went. I did a rock the vote show with Solange Knowles, who has a great CD out. If y'all have Solange CD, go get that. But um, it was a rock the vote show, and, and, and the rock the vote people got mad at me because they, they finally got me to perform at the rock the vote show. You know, and I'm like, yeah, I can perform. And I, the reason I was going to perform is because I felt like that audience was going to go vote for Barack Obama. So I'm like, OK, I can influence that audience, right? And the first thing I said was, when I said, you know, we're up here for Rock the Vote, but I'm here to tell you that I'm here supporting Obama. Um, and, you know, I'm not down with the whole vote for whoever. You know, that's not, that's not me. You know, that's not why I'm here, you know? That's not it at all. And, um, but that's the beauty of, of what, I, what I can do, is that they can be Rock the Vote, and they can do that. And hip-hop is, hip-hop, what it is, is the last folk music. It's music that speaks to the people on the street in the language that they still use and, and they still speak in it. And so I could, I could be that dude who could say, I could say what people are thinking, because when I said that, a lot of people don't say, yeah, that's fine, yeah, I could say that. And, and, and that could be my job to say that, um, to say what people are really feeling, or somebody else can uh, organize stuff. But to just um, bring a full circle, the thing that really impressed me about Barack Obama was his community organizing, which in my mind is a form of activism. Um, doesn't necessarily make him a revolutionary. I think, you know, if you want to be a revolutionary, you have to believe in, you want to tear the whole thing down and start over. I don't think that's what Barack Obama is, is, is doing, but I think that his back, background in community organizing and activism is what has propelled him to these heights and, and what is the thing that makes me and people like me, I think, um, able to relate to him. Um, not everybody in the activist community is rolling with him like that. Um, you know, but some people, you know, some people are so pushed for change so much that they forget that they have to, they have to be agents of change. You can't just expect your opposition to change. Change is God. You change constantly, all the time. Um, if you just expect your opposition to change, and you never change with the times, then, then you just as, as, as blockheaded or just as stubborn or pigheaded as, as your, as your opposition. Um, first thing you have to start with, I think, is you know, you learn in, your, in the home first. It starts with your parents. And, uh, you take care of your own, you take care of your family, then you learn about the block you live on. You know, you're proud of your block, you're proud of where you're from. You, you go to your community. Um, you, are, you become like, just by your nature, an activist in your community, and then you become a citizen of the world um, when you travel more. And what you do is you take those lessons that you learn in the house, on your block, in your community, into the world. And, and that's something that that, uh, that I think hip-hop has helped me to do. Hip-hop has, has allowed me to travel the world and take these lessons I, I learned uh, from my community and um, apply them wherever. Now, I grew up in a nationalistic sort of household where it's like, you know, we uh, black people who live in America and we, and we have an example to set an <coughs> obligation to Africans all over the diaspora. We have access access to resources that Africans all over the world don't have, um, and now those ideas, as I grow older, are challenged. Um, some people have suggested a challenge because we have a black president. I had somebody write on my website, my fan website. You know, now that we have a black president, what are you and people like most deaf and people? What are y'all gonna talk about? You know, and it was a serious question from a serious fan. Like it wasn't a joke. It wasn't trying to make me laugh. Like I have fans who really think like that, you know. And um, 
And then, it, but it, it caused you questions like, well, do we live in a, in a post-racial society? Um, racism in this country is, is the biggest cause of, of all our problems um, that we have in this country because it's built on, on slavery. This country is built on the backs of, of you know, black people in chains. And, and that's something that we can't escape from. But I don't know if racism is the single biggest obstacle that we have nowadays because of of, of my experiences with hip-hop. I think that obstacle might be um, not having the information, I mean, not, not knowing how to use, or not, not being uh, provided the resources, which, you know, you can say is a cause of racism, but I think, you know, you have to go out and, 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 and get those resources. And when I say that, I'm not, I'm not talking about people. I'm not talking about us as a group of people. I'm not talking about activists or black people because there are people in the world who are still very poor and who can't get anything no matter how hard, hard, hard they try. But I'm talking about activists, students, teachers, people who do have access to these resources, you know, is, is, and, and, and how we don't utilize them. Um, that's what I'm really speaking on. How we create these new obstacles for ourselves. Um, I think that One thing that I've, I've always been able to take with me into anything that I've gotten from hip hop is, is, a, is self reliance and like business acumen and, and confidence. Um, those lessons are things that I've been able to apply to all aspects of my life. Um, having to grow and change as an artist has forced me to, to deal with technology in ways that I, I've never had to deal with before. Um, when I first started in the game, the worst thing you could do, the worst thing that could happen is your song get leaked on the internet. Now it's the best thing that could happen, provided it's a, it's a good song. <laughs> um, um, me harnessing this is going to bring it back to is is, is going to bring it back to my community. It's going to, you know, it's going to it's going to provide the infrastructure that my community needs. Me going out and getting and bringing it back. Um, you know, that in other communities besides my own, the dollar bill uh, goes around and touches everybody's hand a few times. Some communities 30 times before it leaves that community. In my community, um, it might touch one or two hands before it goes to somebody else's community. And that's not to say we shouldn't be doing business. We should be doing this to everybody. But, you know, proud black people should be doing business with proud Irish people should be doing business with proud Jews. And that's how you, um, to, you know, develop a mutual respect and understanding. Um, so my examples in hip hop are not like the examples that you get caught into watching on TV, the, the bling bling, the, the rims that change, like progressive people get caught up in those images the same way, quote unquote, supposed ignorant people get caught up in the images. Uh, we look at those images and we say, oh man, why are they playing that stuff on the radio? Why are they not playing more most deaf on the radio? And, and who cares what they play on the radio? You know, most deaf is an artist who can... I'm going to sell records and go on tour for the rest of his days, whether he has a song on the radio or not. You can't say this about these other people. So those, those images are not, it's seductive, but those images are not what represents hip-hop. Um, what represents hip-hop is all of you guys. What represents hip-hop is this room right here. You know, the illest DJ in hip-hop right now on the internet is Mick Boogie. And, you know, he's a white dude from Cleveland. He, you know, he's not the illest DJ because he was, Cutting and scratching the illness and all the parties at Latin quarters and carry crates. He's a marketing major. You know what I'm saying? Like that's why he's a because he knows how to get himself out there. Um, you know, Red Cafe, a rapper from New York City. He got a song called "I'm the Hottest in the Hood" right now. And this was a hot song. He raps the swag is dope. And he got the chains and this and that and that and this. And you look at him, you're like, man, he must have sold a lot of drugs. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, that's how he carries himself. But no, he sold a lot of cribs and houses. He's a real estate agent. <laughs> that's his thing, you know. And and so those are dope. That to me is is, is hip hop, like the working class hip hop. You know, like the, like the way it affects your your whole life. It's not just like oh the images we we see of, of rappers or whatever. Um, and that just doesn't go for hip hop. It goes for school. Goes for activism. Um, my man mentioned in Kiru books. Part of the problem with Kiru Books and why it's not around is because you had a whole bunch of people who cared about having a bookstore um, in the in the community. Um, we had all these meetings and we tried to we wrote for grants and 
you know, try to do fundraisers and poetry readings for fundraisers. We never had any accountants in the meetings. Never had any bankers in the meetings or anybody who knew anything about money, really, other than, you know, how to spend it, you know? <laughs> and they never had any lawyers really in the meeting, you know? And so, um, going back to what I was saying about, you know, Barack Obama, whether he's a revolutionary or not, like, the idea that we're going to take this system and flip it on its head is something that, yeah, I mean, it, in some ways it's very attractive, you know? Um, but the more realistic idea is that you need to have people who have revolutionary thoughts across the board and you need to find out who, what it is about somebody that you relate to. Um, what do you have in common? And you build on the things that you have in common. And when you have that, you can have revolutionary policemen and lawyers and teachers and garbage men and doctors and rappers and students and poets and whatever. Um, and the language of hip-hop and the energy of hip-hop and the, the confidence and the self-reliance and the business acumen, these are things that, that can help with this. And, and it makes it, you know, people like Red Cafe, people like Big Boogie, people like Ninth Wonder, who is an incredible a producer, but also teaches a class on hip hop in, in North Carolina. Um, people like that, to me, are the examples of, of the future of hip hop and how it's, 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 it's revolutionary practice, um, not, just, not just rhetoric. Um, to give you one more example of the power of it, um, like two years ago, no, it was more than two years ago, it was close to like three years ago, I had to catch a plane. I was working on the eardrum album, and I was trying to find quotes to, to put on the top of the album. And I was listening to old records by Stokely Carmichael, I think it's Kwame Ture, he became, right? Kwame Ture? Yeah, and, um, and um, you know, he was, he was talking in a stadium full of people, and he was, he was just mad, and he was, he was talking about black power, and he was cracking this and cracking that, right? And um, I'm listening to this. It's from 1961, um, and I called JetBlue to make a reservation. I was just, I was like, oh, I gotta make my flight, book my flight. And I booked my flight for the next day, got to the airport, stuck my credit card in, and turned around, and, and you know, my credit card didn't work, went to the gate. They said, oh, well, you know, you, you have a problem, you have to go see, walk with these guys. I turned around, and it's like, the men in black is mine. <laughs> like, four dudes in black suits. And they're like, okay, so you gotta come with me. Take me in the back room, and they're like, okay, we got a, a dude from the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, the TSA here, right? And we want to know what you were listening to yesterday when you made your reservation. And and I said, well, what are you, what are you talking about? How do you know what I was listening to? <laughs> and they said, well, you know, they said the, the, the whoever you were speaking to felt like they heard something threatening in the background while you were making your, your flight reservation, all right? So I was like, okay, now these guys, they, 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 they showed me a list of people, names and stuff. All the names were blacked out except for like three people, which was at the time, um, was my girlfriend, my manager, and, and another artist, I think. And, and it was like, you know them? I was like, yeah, I think it was. And I would say they were real nice and everything, and they, they held the blame for me and everything. Um, <laughs> but what I learned from that experience, they, they just wanted to make sure, they said, yeah, we, you know, we knew, we knew you were artists, and we figured it was an artist thing, whatever, but we just had to, you know, we had to do our, 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 our due diligence and, and check it out. And it just made me realize, I was like, wow, it's like, like, people get caught up in those images, those, those, those gangstified images of hip hop that are not threatening, they're not dangerous, they're as powerful as, they have as much power as you give them, you know, and, and here you have Stokely Carmichael making a speech from 40 years ago, 40 years ago, that got them tailing me because I'm listening to the speech and, and, and it's, it's ideas like that that are a lot more dangerous than than uh, than these than these images that we get caught up in and talking about when, and you know I go to schools a lot and, and speak about it a lot and I find myself defending hip hop a lot and, and and I also find myself on the receiving end of a lot of love from people like yourself who love hip hop but the only last thing I can say is just don't get caught up in and what they want you to believe about how powerful these images are you know the reason why you know I can still do this. I don't have a hit record on the radio at all, you know. But I'm still relevant, and y'all still want to hear from me because of the work that I put in. So, um, so with that said, um, once again, I'm, I'm extremely humbled and honored to be here in front of y'all, and, and I look forward to answering whatever questions and participating in a discussion. Thank you.
I'm going to ask the first question. Uh, the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so. Alright, good thing I'm loud. course going on in hip hop now and how it is kind of evolved to where everybody's got a political record. And Ron Fest has a record, Saigon has a record out that actually is getting some play and um, it seems like every rapper wants to do it. Do you think this will have staying power in hip hop and also do you think it'll kind of evolve to where the bubblegum watered down hip hop which we've seen for the past few years as like the mainstream and whereas artists like yourself and those that and the Ron Fest of the world kind of do not get the mainstream appeal. Will that now garner you more success? Because if there is staying power in this political discourse, will you benefit from it? Um, I will say that, and when there's a situation like you have, when the times are changing right now, and you have the recession, and people are thinking more about um, saving money instead of spending money and stuff like that, that artists that are considered to be more message oriented or um, get a lot more play, I, I would definitely say that. But, I mean, I think the beauty of it is that because of the path I've, try, I've tried to take musically, I'm still able to do shows no matter what. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, as far as the, like, like I was saying, the art is going to follow the times. I mean, you know, like an artist like Jeezy, uh, he had Nas on the, on, the, on the President's Black record, and then Jay-Z jumped on the President's Black record. Record and, and it gave the record more weight. And it's like, you know, it was, it was a cute record. Yeah, the president is black, you know, it's cute. You know? But when you when you when you add the what Nas and, and Jay who not because they're from New York, but just because they're from an era where the lyrics were way, way more important, when you add their presence to the record, it just gives it more more weight. And it just it is a moment that that unifies everything, that, that connects everything. You know, like you you know, there's nothing more pop than the Obama girl. That was an incredibly pop one. You, and you seen Obama on the cover of Vanity Fair, he looked like Derek Zoolander. <laughs> <laughs> That's Magnum, you know? <laughs> I mean, it ain't no more pop than that, you know? It's like, um, so I think, you know, it's like Jay-Z said on, his, on, his, on, on, on the remix, he said, you know, I was already, I was hot before Barack, so imagine what I'm going to do now. And, and that's how I feel. If you uh, raise your hand, I'll get it around to you. I'll do the first question for you. Hi, I just want to thank you, first of all, for being here. I'm so excited. Um, but I, I'm a professor, and I teach at Howard now, and I'm fortunate enough to teach at West Virginia. Um, and I look at myself primarily as a teacher. And you mentioned earlier that you feel that one of the biggest obstacles today is teachers have the resources, but they don't utilize, utilize them. You find that there are obstacles. Can you give us some sort of specific examples of obstacles and how I can get around that? <laughs> I really don't want to be a part of the problem. Um, yeah, I mean, what I was trying to say with that is um, connecting the, the idea of um, sort of the grassroots approach to that the, the idea that hip hop is still a folk music and you in and, 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 and dealing with it, you have to have a grassroots approach to dealing with it. You have to sort of participate in hip hop if you're going to talk about it, or else no one wants to listen to you. And and, and connecting that to. Uh, Obama's grassroots approach. 